um, speaker today is Professor Christian Ludwig from um, University of Geneva. And he's also visiting professor at the Università della Svizzera Italiana in Lugano. He has several degrees um, in physics from the University of Bern and in history and philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge, as well as in um, philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he obtained his PhD in history and philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh afterwards. And since then, he conducted various research studies, for example, at Parameter Institute in Canada, Center of Theoretical Physics in Marseille, the University of Tübingen, and the University of California, San Diego. He received an impressive list of prizes and grants, just to mention one more recent one from the John Templeton Foundation for Research Collaboration between the University of Illinois, Chicago, and the University of Geneva. So by training, he's both physicist and philosopher, and his research therefore is on the field um, of philosophy of physics, with a more current focus on philosophical foundations of quantum gravity. And today he will talk about beyond the limits of analog experiments. We are very happy that you accepted our invitation and are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation, uh, which I very gladly accepted. As uh, you correctly said, I'm uh, by training, I'm both a philosopher and a physicist, but for the last um, quite a few years now, I've worked mainly as a philosopher. I do philosophy of physics, so I look closely at what physicists do, uh, but what I uh, consider myself be doing is not contributing to physics research per se, but instead of sort of reflecting on what's going on in physics with uh, sort of more philosophically interested questions. And uh, one, uh, I'm going to present one such set of considerations concerning, uh, you could say, uh, the epistemology of uh, scientific experiments uh, uh, and the met methodology concerning in particular the case of black hole thermodynamics. That's, that's the, the, the focus today. So black hole thermodynamics is a hypothesis you could sort of summarize as asserting that black holes are thermodynamic objects. They have a temperature, they have an entropy, they radiate through uh, Hawking radiation. I probably don't need to explain much um, what this is in the, with this audience, I assume, uh, but just to repeat two important points, uh, they have an entropy which can be calculated according to the so-called Bekenstein-Hawking formula. And the important uh, aspect of this is that uh, the entropy is proportional to the area of the event horizon. In 1975, Hawking published uh, the paper, that's the reference up here, where he uh, presented a calculation which showed that in the presence of a black hole that the quantum field theoretic vacuum state is in a thermal state, that is it radiates um, uh, as seen from infinity, asymptotic infinity at uh, a certain temperature, which is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. So in short, Hawking radiation is a black body radiation of a black hole at a temperature. Uh, temperature T as seen as in, uh, infinity. Good. Now, uh, although black hole thermodynamics as a whole field with all laws of black hole thermodynamics and all the different aspects has a surprising, really remarkable degree of coherence with established physics, and which is why I think almost all physicists, at least those physicists I talk to, are convinced that black holes are thermodynamic objects. But it needs to be said that the central thesis of black hole thermodynamics are not empirically confirmed. They, these are theoretical experiments, oh, sorry, theoretical considerations and arguments which have convinced physicists that black holes are thermodynamic objects. These are not empirical results. Uh, there are some arguments uh, which uh, Bekenstein, when he, he uh, started to develop black hole thermodynamics in the early 1970s, uh, he produced some arguments based on information theoretic considerations and certain, certain thought experiments, what would happen 
if you would, if you would, you know, there would be such and such a process if you would drop an entropy package into a black hole and things like that. And by using all sorts of arguments like this, he tried to argue that black holes have an entropy. Uh, but uh, most physicists didn't really take this original argument very seriously. Nobody really believed that black hole thermodynamics, uh, black holes are thermodynamic objects until the 1975 article by Hawking. Hawking himself, in fact, was motivated to do that calculation in order to show that black holes couldn't possibly be thermodynamic objects. And then he got a, a result which surprised himself uh, and which convinced himself that these are, in fact, uh, thermodynamic objects. So the fact that black holes can radiate, which classically, of course, they cannot as perfect absorbers, means they can equilibrate, they can show thermodynamic behavior like ordinary thermodynamic objects or systems. And as Rafael Sorkin has said, uh, I think capturing what many physicists believe to be the case, um, the Hawking radiation is really the best known piece of evidence for the association of uh, horizon area with entropy and for black hole thermodynamics in general. Um, so the question then is, if black hole uh, radiation or Hawking radiation is so central to the whole idea of black hole thermodynamics is, um, you know, could there be some sort of empirical confirmation of Hawking radiation rather than just theoretical arguments and considerations? If we could measure, if we could detect uh, Hawking radiation, that would give us a very convincing confirmation of this whole sort of complex of ideas. Now, the problem, as I'm sure you're aware, is that it's not detectable in practice, at least not for astrophysical black holes, because the temperature of the radiation we would have to detect for solar mass uh, black holes is about 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7, perhaps Kelvin or something of that order. And for supermassive black holes of the kind that we would expect them at the center of galaxies, it's even much less. It's 10 to the minus 14 or somewhere around there uh, because they're very massive. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that these are tiny, tiny temperatures that we could not possibly detect. Uh, against the natural fluctuations of the microwave, the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so that's not really an option for detecting um, Hawking radiation. So 40 years ago, Bill Unruh therefore proposed uh, an intriguing idea that instead we should be looking at so-called analog systems. We could think we, we should come up with physical systems which essentially show the same physics, at least in, in, in some sense, as black holes. And we should use those systems to perform experiments on it to make observations. So if you think, for instance, of, uh, of a fluid, that was the original one of the original proposals of a fluid flowing in flux, then uh, you have as as for instance, the, the fluid accelerates towards like something like a waterfall, then uh, at some point, the speed of the, of the fluid will reach what is this, uh, the, the, the speed of propagation of sound in that, in that medium. And it, by that, it would create a horizon. So if a fish would be uh, swimming downstream along with, with that flowing uh, fluid, at some point, the fish could not uh, emit sound waves or sound signals anymore that could be uh, received by uh, the asymptotic companion fish that could detect these signals. Um, now, there are many other such systems, it turns out, where we could have something like that, something like event horizons present, uh, in particular also in Bose-Einstein condensates. And uh, five years ago, Jeff Steinhauer in Israel has published an article where he uh, described how he has um, uh, detected Hawking radiation in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, as far as I know, this is not a result that's been reproduced by other groups elsewhere, but it remains, uh, 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 it, it opens uh, at least for, from a philosophical point of view, an intriguing possibility. Namely, that we could 
considered the detection of Hawking radiation in these analog systems as a confirmation of Hawking radiation in astrophysical black holes. But the idea, of course, of this analog form of reasoning is that if two systems are known to be similar in some relevant respects, then they're also, we're also justified in thinking that they're similar in some unknown respects. So if, if we think that the physics uh, for the black hole and the analog system is somewhat uh, relevantly the same, and we would detect in one case Hawking radiation, then we would infer that in the other case, there should be Hawking radiation as well. So the central question is, can analog models confirm gravitational Hawking radiation? Can we learn anything about black holes from these analog models? And more generally, can analog models confirm hypotheses regarding inaccessible target systems? Because one problem, of course, is that an astrophysical uh, black hole is not accessible in the same set way as, as an experimental system is in terrestrial physics. Um, now, interestingly, uh, a bit, almost four years ago, uh, Ruddy Inderdashti, Karin Tepo, and Eric Winsberg published an article where they said that analog experiments can, in fact, yield such a confirmation. In fact, they give us reason to believe in a particular hypothesis about the systems that they're supposed to represent, or as uh, is, it's said in the literature about the target system, that is the, the system that is really the target of your interest. In our case, black holes. And they offered an in-depth study of analog gravity and how it can confirm gravitational or astrophysical Hawking radiation. The idea can be expressed in, in this sort of uh, uh, systematic uh, figure here. So the target system is the black hole. That's what we're really interested in. And the question is, do black holes emit Hawking radiation? That's what we would like to detect. That's what we would like to confirm in empirical ways. Of course, we have a model, a mathematical model that describes the black hole, that represents the phenomena that we're interested in. The idea is now that we have here a right-hand side, which exactly mirrors the situation with black holes. We have some analog system, a Bose-Einstein condensate or some sort of hydrodynamical system, uh, which is, of course, also described by a theoretical and mathematical model uh, describing the physics uh, that's going on in, 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 this, in this analog system. And if we now emit, sorry, detect Hawking radiation in this analog system, the idea would be that this confirms the uh, Hawking radiation over here. Now, for this inference to work, uh, Dardashti, Tebo, and Winsberg argue that we need to establish the external validity of this experiment on the right hand side here. And establishing the external validity, that is, to sort of make an inference from the, the experimental system beyond to the target system, we need to have two things in place. First is what they call a syntactic isomorphism. Uh, that's a relatively straightforward uh, step in the sense that what we need is basically the same mathematical description here of the relevant physics. That's the sense in which they have to Isomorphic. So the mathematics used to describe uh, the black hole here or the, the radiation here has to be the same, relevantly the same as on, on that side. And this can be shown to be the case. In fact, this was already to some degree established by Bill Unruh 40 years ago. And this is interesting. This is intriguing that the same mathematics can be used to describe the physics in these two cases. But if it's just the mathematics, then it's a formal analogy, uh, which we do not know whether it has some physical relevance, whether it's the physics is also relevantly the same. Because we know that sometimes uh, uh, mathematics can be, the same mathematics can be used to describe very different physics or different systems. For instance, the, the lot carvel terra model of predator and prey populations is a very, very general mathematical model that can be used to describe the behavior of systems which are very, very different and we would think have nothing to do with one another. Uh, so the question is to what extent does this formal analogy 
now really uh, tell us something about the physics. And for this, we need the second condition here, which is uh, the idea of uh, adequacy, adequacy conditions. In other words, what we need to uh, make sure is that in both cases on the left and the right hand side, this representation relation here between the model and the, the physical system is adequate. Uh, this is this, meaning that the mathematics we use really adequately and relevantly describes the physics that's going on here. And we need to do this on both sides, of course. Um, now, for this, uh, in their argument, uh, DTW, the Rashti, and Winsberg make two assumptions, namely that for certain purposes and to a certain degree of desired accuracy, I mean, these are all in, at some level approximations, of course. Um, the modeling framework uh, MS, that is the modeling framework used to describe the analog system is adequate for modeling the analog system within a certain domain of conditions. And we need to make exactly the same assumption about the black hole. So we need to assume that the modeling framework for the black hole is adequate for modeling black hole physics. Um, now, if these uh, uh, adequacy conditions are successfully established, they would uh, tell us that it's not just a formal uh, sort of analogy. It's not just an, a, a mathematical coincidence that we use the same uh, mathematics to describe. This really gets uh, the realm of physics exactly right in both cases. And so the physics must be in some sense at least direct of the same. Now, of course, if you look at step two here, they are assuming that black holes are accurately described by the modeling framework from which uh, Hawking radiation is derived. That's one assumption that needs to be made. In other words, this here uh, is, a, is an analogy that needs to be presupposed. This is, you know, this is uh, the same over here as well. Okay. Now, I'm not going to read that quote, but they just tell us uh, what that means uh, or, or why they're confident in doing that very briefly. Uh, what they have is they say we have a fixed classical space time that features the establishment of an event horizon via gravitational collapse normally leading to a black hole. And secondly, we have a quantum scalar field evaluated in the regions of past and future low infinity, which are assumed to be Minkowski. Now, what you need to make sure actually is, sorry, the typo here is that uh, you can deal with the so-called transplanking model if, uh, sorry, problem if you can, uh, convince yourself that there is no such problem of transplanking physics, then uh, you are somewhat confident that the modeling framework in the black hole is correct. Now, the problem is all of these arguments, uh, uh, also including the arguments trying to uh, address the transplanking problem, all of this work is theoretical. None of this is any empirical confirmation, but the problem with this is that it's not known if the particular modeling framework used in the derivation of Hawking radiation is actually describing black holes in the first place. That's in a way what we want to confirm. So we're not allowed to uh, help ourselves to this assumption uh, in the setup of, of the argument. That's the problem. Now, how could we convince ourselves that the modeling framework is correct? I see two ways. Uh, one is, of course, empirical confirmation uh, in the usual way it's done in physics, or we would have a more fundamental theory of quantum gravity, for instance, which would underwrite the adequacy of the modeling framework and from which we could derive uh, from more fundamental physics that you know, there is, for instance, no transplanking problem. Uh, now, the problem is we, because we don't have any empirical confirmation, that was precisely the reason, of course, why we wanted to do analog gravity. And unlike in the case of analog models, we don't know the correct theory of quantum gravity yet. We don't have a, a very good control of the fundamental physics uh, on the left-hand side, as it were, on the side of the, uh, of the black holes. So in the analog cases, we do have fundamental theories. In fact, layers of fundamental th theories. 
uh, that you can go from approximations to a more precise, and more rigorous, and more fundamental description using sort of maybe molecular hydrodynamics or Bob Alupov, Bose uh, Einstein concept theory, and ultimately, of course, some form of, of quantum field theory is going to describe the physics there. And you have a, a pretty good theoretical control over what you're doing, and you have ample empirical confirmation that this is the correct uh, theoretical framework in which to analyze the physics. So we have very good solid control theoretically and experimentally on the side of the analog physics. But of course, the pro problem is exactly that we do not have anything like that in the case of black hole physics. Um, Okay, in a way you can ask yourself or you can say the question is, what we would like to know is whether black holes fall in the same universality class as the analog systems that we're considering, that we're testing, that we're building in our, in our physics labs. Uh, same universality class, meaning that they show the same relevant behavior uh, in this respect. And of course, if we would then find that all the other members, the terrestrial physical members of that universality class show or exhibit Hawking radiation, then we could be very confident that black holes do it as well. But of course, the question is precisely whether black holes fall into that universality class or not. That's the, the really the, has the question we would like to know the answer to and we would like to have empirical confirmation for. So in sum, in a paper which is forthcoming, uh, I concluded together with Karen Crowther and Niels Lindemann that uh, by assuming that black holes are ad adequately described by the modeling framework from which the derivation of Hawking radiation is a necessary consequence, these authors already assumed the conclusion that they're trying to establish, namely that Hawking radiation exists in black holes. So it's in this sense that this is a circular form of confirmation. It's begging the question. So it's not giving us uh, a sort of a new uh, independent empirical confirmation. Now, you could argue, of course, against this and say, um, okay, maybe it's not confirmation we get, but surely we're learning something when we do analog gravity and when we test these things. And I would certainly agree that we learn uh, quite a bit when we do analog gravity. Analog gravity is a, is a fascinating area which has become a very active research area where we learn a lot about the physics of analogs of these analog systems. There's no doubt about that. But the question is, are we learning something about black holes? And you could say that, okay, what we get in the case of black holes is not confirmation for that. We would indeed need direct empirical evidence from black holes, but surely it adds some plausibility. If we see the same thing happening with uh, analog systems in terrestrial physics, then that makes it more plausible in some sense that black holes behave the same way. Uh, I have some... Uh, reactions to this. Now, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by plausibility or what the opponent would mean by plausibility here. If they mean that analog gravity can deliver a proof of concept, namely that it's possible that, you know, uh, or, or that it's even the case that the system described by these models does exhibit uh, Hawking radiation, then that's fine. Absolutely. There's no question about that. So in that sense, yes, it adds plausibility. Um, but it doesn't deliver confirmation. In other words, it doesn't tell us uh, whether uh, our belief that black holes are thermodynamics or objects is true. That is not confirmed. Okay. Uh, how much, how am I doing for time? Am I, is it about 15 minutes? Yes. Sorry? You're doing, fine. you're doing fine in total. It's like 45 to 50 minutes. So you okay. still have like 20 minutes at least. Good, great. So let me quickly, in the second paper, let me quickly present the results of the second paper where uh, this is made more precise with, with a fourth author, Stefan Hartmann, 
uh, what they mean by confirmation. And what they mean by confirmation is they use a, base, a Bayesian model. So they have a Bayesian network. They draw a Bayesian network. This is the Bayesian network that they, that, that they draw. Now, I'm not sure whether you, how much you know about Bayesian networks, but these are uh, variables or magnitudes uh, or theses uh, that uh, are related in some sense with one another in a, for, in, a, in a network of dependencies or relationships which are exhibited by these arrows. M, this note here, is the idea or the proposition that the modeling framework is empirically an empirically adequate description of the physics of the target system, in our case of the black holes. That's M. A is the corresponding assumption that the modeling framework is empirically adequate for the analog system. Now, E is the evidence that we find, namely the detection of the Hawking radiation in the analog system. Uh, so suppose that is observed. Now, here, this X, uh, that's uh, sort of a universality assumption that the physics in M, or you know, in this mode here in the black hole case, and the physics in the analog gravity case is relevantly the same. Now, it is this parent node here. It's apparent because it has uh, dependencies away from X to M and to A. Uh, which underwrites this universality claim. And if you assume, if you accept that this is the Bayesian network of dependencies, then you can prove the following theorem. Assuming a positive probabilistic dependence for each of these three edges in the network, uh, then you can show that the probability of M given E, a uh, conditional on E, is larger than the probability of M. So the probability that the modeling framework adequately represents the modeling physics of the target system in black holes increases if we conditionalize on the evidence E. In other words, it is confirming uh, evidence. If we detect Hawking radiation in an analog model, then this confirms astrophysical Hawking radiation. Now, you need to make uh, assumptions here that positive probabilistic dependence. Um, I'm not going to go into this uh, in any detail, but you need to assume that given X, the probability of M is higher than it is given not X. Uh, so in other words, uh, it's uh, more likely the case that black holes behave uh, in, uh, in this, in the way they do, given that they're part of the universality class than not. So this is what asserts the positive relevance for the universality argument for the target system. Now, the authors think that this is perfectly modest because by assuming such a connection, you don't, uh, you're, you're not thereby certain that the physics of the black hole is really uh, like this, is adequately described by the modeling framework. The only thing what you need to assert is that it's the probability that this is the case is somewhere between zero and one, exclusive uh, the, uh, the boundaries. But connecting variables X and M in the graph, we already presuppose, even though in a probabilistic way, what we would like to establish, namely that black holes fall into that relevant universality class. Now, uh, it may appear that this is a weak assumption because the only thing you need to assume is that this probability is not zero. Uh, it's nevertheless the case that if you accept this as correctly describing the situation, the Bayesian network that is, uh, it's the case that you can do a, uh, you know, enough lab work on terrestrial systems such that you can virtually be certain that black holes emit Hawking radiation. You never ever need to look at a black hole uh, to get to any level of certainty to, to, uh, to get that. That cannot possibly be right, it seems to us, because what we're precisely interested in is whether 
black holes are appropriately modeled. And uh, it, it seems like even though we can get possibility from uh, you know, doing terrestrial analog gravity, uh, none of this can really make us uh, to any degree uh, you desire uh, certain that this is in fact the case. Now, I have an analogy of, uh, from philosophy of mind, which I'm going to skip, but if you're interested in philosophy of mind, I'll be happy to talk about this in Q&A. Now, that was uh, the, the status of the, the debate until very recently. Now, uh, just at the end of last year, Peter Evans and Corinne Thibault have um, published a paper in which they respond to the paper by Kraut, Lindemann, and myself. Um, even though it's not published yet, uh, they respond to it. And here's what they say. Our second core claim is that an experiment of a manipulable and accessible source system of a given type, that is the kind of terrestrial analog system you have, that's manipulable because you can manipulate it it's accessible, it's in your lab, and so on and so forth. So experimenting on a system like that can in some circumstances be used to make inductive inferences regarding a target system of a different type. Um, in particular, when we have good reason to believe that the source and target phenomena and questions are universal, uh, it is possible to make inductive inferences from the existence of the phenomena in the source system. So when we detect talking radiation, in an analog system to the existence of the phenomena in the target system, so that to the existence of Hawking radiation. Now, this they accept is a new form of intertype uniformity principle. That is, you have a principle according to which physical systems of different types nevertheless fall under the same universality class. Okay, and they think that this kind of, of assumption or principle is really similar uh, to other uniformity principles that we accept. For instance, there's spatial uniformity principles, assuming that if you make a physical experiment uh, of a certain kind, if you test uh, something on, a, on, a, on an analog system in a, in a physics lab in Geneva, uh, you will get the same uh, as, as you will in Trieste, for instance. So when you in, make some experiments in Trieste, you can make inferences how elsewhere in the world or in the universe this would look like. That's a sort of a, a spatial extrapolation if you want. Of course, you can do the same thing time-wise. You could say that if we perform this experiment today, what we will see should give us some indication of what we would see were we to do it tomorrow. So that's a way of extrapolating in time. Space and time extrapolations are very common, of course, because we assume that the same laws of physics govern, uh, at least for the most part, uh, the, the, the relevant area of space time. And of course, if we have one type of system, if we have uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate, we make experiments on that, then we can also make an inference to all other Bose-Einstein condensates, to all other physical systems of the same kind. If we detect that a copper wire uh, uh, is, is a good conductor, then we can infer that copper in general, any wire made of copper is a good conductor. So it's, it's, a, it's an inference, an extrapolation to include all physical systems of the same kind. But now, what they think is that this extrapolation to other kinds of system is really no different from those kind of extrapolations. Now, of course, the relevant question is whether uh, this is a, is a problematic inference or not. Uh, they go as far as to say that it would be as unreasonable to doubt a principle of extrapolation like that as it is unreasonable to doubt that uh, the basic laws of nature will still be holding tomorrow. So that's the, the inductive skeptic, which some philosophers uh, like to think about. Uh, but they also think that if somebody's an inductive skeptic, then you cannot do any science whatsoever because you, you're just not accepting the idea of extrapolating 
uh, or assuming that uh, the, the, the laws of nature have some form of globality. Okay, so we have inductions really of two kinds that are going to be relevant for us here. Uh, it's the in inference from accessible to inaccessible systems and the inference from intra-type, that is of systems of the same type to systems of that type to other, to systems of a different type. These are two different kinds of inductions that we're going to be interested in. And they give us a very nice example of, uh, of, of a physical system or physical processes which are intra-types of the same type, uh, but where we make inferences to inaccessible systems. And that's the case of stellar nuclear synthesis. So if you do astrophysics, uh, main sequence stars, uh, which is a class of stars which includes our sun, the, the, the theory, the accepted theory in astrophysics tells us that there are two principal reactions which transform hydrogen into helium. There's the so-called proton-proton chain of the uh, so-called carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. It doesn't matter what the details are of these two um, sort of processes uh, which transform hydrogen into helium, but there are these two kinds. Now, What's common to both of them is that they take place deep in the core of the star, not on, on its sort of surface or anywhere near the surface. And the relative abundance of the two reactions depends on the size of the star. Uh, so there, there is, a, uh, in astrophysics, there's a rather detailed uh, theory and understanding of, of this nuclear synthesis in stars. Now, clearly, both of these processes are unmanipulable. That is, they're not accessible to manipulation by experimental physicists because we cannot go to the interior of, of stars. And they're at least sort of visually, photonically inaccessible. That is, we cannot see them in the visual uh, uh, frequencies. We cannot detect signals directly from these sort of reactions. However, and this is an important point, that doesn't mean that we cannot detect uh, directly uh, what's going on in the interior of stars. In fact, the neutrinos created in these reactions can be detected on Earth. Now, as Evans and Thibault rightly say, the inference from observed phenomena of the stellar surfaces, so the surfaces we can see, of course, and what's going on in interstellar space, that is in the space between the star and, and Earth, uh, and of course from terrestrial physics. So we have a lot of knowledge about the spectra of terrestrial atomic systems, of nuclear phenomena. Uh, physicists have a hundred years or more uh, experience of uh, 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 experimenting on systems like that. Now, given all of this, all of our knowledge of astrophysics, including astrophysical observations, but also, and very importantly, of course, particle physics, uh, well-confirmed theories of particle physics, means that the theory of stellar nuclear synthesis is largely confirmed. Uh, that means they conclude that it's not the inaccessibility of a black hole in itself that makes it uh, 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 sort of not amenable to empirical verification. And I certainly agree with that. So it's not just the inaccessibility in itself that is problematic. There is, they say, prima facie, however, a fundamental difference between uh, inference, that is in the case of stellar nuclear synthesis and the astrophysical Hawking radiation, if one thinks that there is a fundamental difference in kind between the intra-type regularity principles, because uh, it's the same type of physical systems that exist in the interior of the star. So the proton, you know, the hydrogen, the helium, the protons, the, the, all these uh, particles and atoms that we believe are uh, present in, this, in the uh, core of a star are, of course, of the same type than the protons and etc. on Earth. Uh, so in that sense, the intratype regularity principles. Uh, and then, you know, the astrophysical Hawking radiation is an intertype regularity because a black hole is not the same thing 
uh, or not a priori the same thing as the Bose Einstein condensate. Okay. Now, they say they find nothing special about intertype inductive reasoning that bars inductive triangulation, the sort of inductive reasoning that we would have used, for instance, in the case of stellar nuclear synthesis. And they base this on two observations. First, they say that a lot of intratype reasoning in science might be reinterpreted as intertype reasoning in a given context. And they think of molecular material science, life sciences. And it's true. Sometimes, what makes two systems of the same type or of different types can be reinterpreted depending on how you think of these different systems. And maybe once you come to understand that the relevant phenomena are the same in two cases, you may then have a good reason to actually subsume the two systems as of the same type, at least vis-a-vis -vis a certain experimental or certain phenomena that you're interested in. So it's true, it's difficult, it turns out, to have a principled sort of firm distinction between these two cases. Moreover, there exist examples of scientists using Wilsonian type universality arguments to justify intertype reasoning of this form in a range of condensed matter contexts. So you can use uh, arguments from physics established in uh, condensed uh, matter physics, for instance, uh, where you have uh, valid forms of reasoning from one type to an, uh, uh, of system to another type of system. So you could summarize the situation as follows. You have the accessible uh, systems which and um, inferences of intertype these are, of course, completely unproblematic. They're accessible anyway. If you don't believe me that this copper wire conducts as well as the other copper wire, it's accessible, it's there, test it. No problem, right? That's unproblematic. Now, there's one type of inference which uses those uh, kind of uh, insights to infer then to inaccessible systems. So if there is a copper wire on the back uh, side of, of Jupiter, uh, it's not really exactly accessible to us, but nevertheless, there's good reason to think that this is exactly of the same type and therefore we could unproblematically assume that it conducts electricity. On the other hand, we have the inference to another system which may be prima facie of a different type, but it's accessible. I say that the physics here in this Bose-Einstein condensate is relevantly similar of the same kind as in this hydrodynamical system, for instance. There are prima facie different types of systems, but both of them are accessible. If you don't believe me, you can always go and test the other system. So they're both accessible. Both of these uh, are frequent ways in which we make inferences, we extrapolate, and they seem to be completely unproblematic. The question now is whether combining both of them, so you make an inference from something that is accessible of the same kind, now to something that's not accessible for empirical verification, and which is a prima facie, at least of a different type. The question is whether that diagonal inference is in any way problematic. And Evans and Tippel think it isn't. One final option, of course, of, 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 of interpreting our uh, argument, they say, might be that there is an inferential problem specific to inferences based upon the combination of the two. So going along the diagonal, and this is exactly right. This is what we try to show that this is, is, this is dangerous and problematic. The idea might be that there's some problem inherent to this combined inference that is not reducible to either of its components. It is difficult, however, to see how the logic of such reasoning would work. If it is permissible to reason separately from accessible to inaccessible systems and from systems of one type to systems of another, then we need some reason why it is not permissible in principle to reason from accessible systems to one, of one type to inaccessible systems of another type so long as our inferences obey classical logic, such as concatenation must be accepted. Uh, there seems no room for reasonable doubt. I think this is an extremely strong statement. I think there's no room for reasonable doubt that this is a valid inference. 
Uh, now, I would certainly want to say that no, classical logic is not valid for such inferences. These are inductive inferences, not deductive ones. Maybe yeah, given that you're scientists, you're not so much interested in, in, in logic here, but it's, they, they misuse logic in that statement. Um, but the problem is that the concatenation, the combination of an inference can both to systems which are inaccessible and presumably of a different type is exactly what is problematic. Uh, and it's problematic if we think that this is an inference uh, uh, that we can, through which we can get a confirmation that the physics of this inaccessible uh, physical system of a different type is the same. That's the problem. It's this combination of simultaneously inferring to an inaccessible system that is of a different type that makes the inference risky. Okay, so given the inaccessibility of the system, we cannot assume that it is of the relatively same type that is in the same universality class. For that, we would have to test it. And how, you know, if it would be accessible, we could test it, but that would be no problem. If we have other reasons, like in the case of nuclear synthesis, to say, to think that it's exactly of the same type, it's exactly the same kind of system, then that would be fine as well. But we don't have sufficient control for either of these inferences to work. So let me conclude. Now, an important thing is if I've given talks about black hole thermodynamics to physicists, sometimes people have thought that I object to the idea that black holes are thermodynamic objects. This is not the case at all. Um, I think with all we know, we have very good reason to think that they are thermodynamic objects. I'm not disputing this. My question is, how do we establish that? How can we learn or be sure, reasonably sure, that this is the case uh, that is in fact the case. And this, I think, is, is what's interesting and not trivial. So there are arguments, theoretical arguments, and considerations you can make for black holes to be thermodynamic objects. Many of these are extremely suggestive, very suggestive, and it's, as I said already, it's remarkable the coherence with known physics that we find uh, by assuming that black holes are thermodynamic uh, objects. But this is not conclusive because, as I said, it lacks empirical confirmation. Now, for all its ingenuity, the argument that Thibault and collaborators in various papers have produced crucially bad the question by assuming what it is that we want to confirm. And of course, in that sense, it's a circular form of justification. Now, eventually what we will need, of course, is we need firmer constraints on theorizing. So we need theoretical uh, uh, progress in quantum gravity, uh, which may be eventually, of course, even be empirically confirmed, maybe in, in very, uh, very different ways than detecting Hawking radiation, of course. And if we can have that, if we can get a theoretical framework, which is in itself confirmed more fundamentally, which tells us then that black holes uh, are thermodynamic objects because, for instance, the trans uh, problem uh, dissolves or something like that, then that would be, of course, uh, the, of the kind of work that's needed. Uh, or some sort of maybe, maybe you know, very tiny black holes, if you can create tiny black holes in a lab, which then quickly evaporate because they're so tiny, of course, and you can detect the detection, that would be, that would be awesome. That would be certainly giving us confirmation uh, that we're seeking. So in other words, what you need to do is you need to do astrophysics, you need to do quantum gravity, and in particular, quantum gravity phenomenology. Thank you very much. Okay, we thank you very much for this uh, very, very nice talk to follow. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. Um, I will look in the chat. If you want, you can just speak up or raise your hand. Can I make a question? Yes, sure. Hi, um, I'm Stefano Hi. Liberati. Yes, um, I think we've met at some point. Yes, we did. Right. <laughs> so thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, um, so if I understand correctly, what you basically say is that there is a, a gap in the analogy in the sense that we understand fully the analog system. We have very much control about it. 
But what we need is that to be sure that what we see in the sky, what we call black holes, are basically well described at the suitable approximations from GR plus uh, quantum filter and curve space time. Basically, they are really black hole. For example, they could be ultra compact objects with a, a surface within the light ring supported by some kind of new physics. That uh, is your objection. And by testing Hawking radiation in analog gravity, you cannot prove that uh, it will be. Uh, in, in, you, you cannot uh, uh, apply the analogy in a straightforward way because basically these objects, you don't know if uh, basically, because normally the argument is that if they have the same mathematics, right? If I have a quantum filter and a curved metric, the metric is describing an object with an horizon, then basically you can derive of okay, radiation. You don't need to know GR, you don't need to know what is the, the physics underlying the metric or uh, if the scalar field propagating on it is a quasi, is a quasi particle in a bose einstein condensate or uh, is some uh, photon in a curved background, you see? Um, so uh, if I understand, is this, this is the crucial point of your uh, criticism of the... Yes. Is it, yeah, yes. now I have a few, few comments from the side of someone making research uh, from in this, in this one. So um, I see your point and I think it, it's, it's pretty fair. Um, I have uh, one comment, which is uh, maybe you may be interested to know that Steinauer did also the experiment in 2019 and 20, and now the evidence for the detection of Hawking radiation and the fact that there is a suitable regime, which is really described uh, uh, by the theory of Hawking radiation, that means quantum filter and curve space time, um, that is very much uh, confirmed. So, but that of course is perfectly fine for you because it's just a confirmation that we understand very well the analog system and that the analog black hole behaves as it is supposed to do by the theory of a quasi particle on a bose einstein condensate. That, that's what you would say, right? Now, uh, another point uh, is that uh, in your presentation, you touch the transplanting problem, um, but I would like to say, to stress that, the, that this is, was much more crucial in the analog gravity community than what it may seem from outside. In a certain sense, the focus uh, of the community 20 years ago wasn't so much to prove that uh, astrophysical black hole radiated by Hawking radiation. The proof, uh, the, the, the really uh, focus of the research was this, uh, even assuming quantum filter in curve space time and the fact that uh, astrophysics form black hole, that means object with an event horizon. Still, uh, there was a fly in the ointment, which was the fact that the Hawking derivation seems to rely on a knowledge of the theory of space-time and quantum field theory at transplankian regimes. And so the point was, is the Hawking radiation derivation robust against the transplankian regime? Analog gravity provides a system where you know what is the transplankian regime, and you can prove within which approximation the Hawking radiation result, the temperature that you show, is confirmed, even if there is new physics at transplankian scale. In the case of uh, condensed matter system is basically the breakdown of Lorentz invariance, which then stem what you say, ground to gravity phenomenology, all the quantum gravity phenomenology or a good branch of it in testing Lorentz violation came from part of the analog gravity community, myself as well. Um, and then uh, um, I have, sorry if I am making a long comment, but I, I just want to condense it. And another, so, because you stimulated the, your, your talk, uh, some thoughts that I, may, I, I think you may find interesting per se. Uh, and this is one thing so that uh, you see for me, an extra criterion that make me think that if black hole forms in astrophysics, then they must be object is self-consistency because general relativity predicts the four laws of black hole mechanics, Bardeen Carter Oak in 1973. If you apply those law, and you don't have the possibility of radiating, okay, radiation, then you can lead to violation of the generalized second law. So to me, it seems that uh, at least from internal consistency, general relativity must have some way to make black hole radiate because otherwise it wouldn't be self-consistent. It's very amazing and tantalizing that you need quantum field theory to do this, but a, a, of course, you can say maybe in astrophysics, we don't form black holes. What we see in the sky are not black holes, are ultra compact objects. My final comment is that interestingly enough, analog gravity 
can even describe what happens if you have, for example, a forever collapsing object that never crossed the horizon. And uh, you can simulate this kind of physics on an analog gravity model. So the analog gravity may have also the, the power to simulate uh, um, situations which are not the standard one for which it was thought about. That means, for example, the black hole thermodynamics. And that is also something that uh, might be interesting to, to explore. Thank you. Sorry for the long comment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let me re react to some of what you said, uh, if I may. So first of all, yes, I think, you know, obviously uh, people working, experimentalists working in analog gravity will uh, make progress as, you know, Jack Steinhauer does or, or maybe other groups as well. I don't follow day to day, you know, the, the new results there. And uh, if they find that uh, certain um, assumptions or, you know, that, that, that the modeling frameworks they're assuming is confirmed there, that there's no problem of trans in physics, uh, all of these sort of things, that, that's fine. I think when, when we do that, that kind of research, we learn a lot about these analog systems. And we, in, in a way, it's a proof of concept in the sense that we know that we can do uh, quantum field theory on, on, on some, something like curved space-time with event horizons, uh, in a way that's uh, coherent and in which, uh, which, is, which can be resistant, as you said, I think that was your word, res uh, resists against uh, trans in physics uh, interference. Robustness, uh, we call oh, it sorry, robustness. robustness. Robustness, sorry. Uh, which is robust against trans in physics. Now, all of this is perfectly fine, but nevertheless, this is work done on analog systems. What is the guarantee, the empirical confirmation that black holes are uh, behave in the same way. That's exactly the question. So uh, in a way, I, th I think, you know, much of this work is extremely fascinating and important. It's very suggestive also. It's very plausible, giving a lot of possibility. There's no doubt about that uh, with, you know, sort of coherence uh, of it within known physics, I, I would, say, you know, different aspects, not just GR, but uh, including uh, quantum field theory as well. And, and that is impressive. Now, the, you know, what, what, should we, what should we think about the, the argument about, uh, I think that was, was your third point, about the internal consistency or coherence of the idea of black holes as we have it in GR. Now, it's true that the black hole uh, thermodynamical laws uh, are in perfect analogy with thermodynamical laws. And these are laws that we can find uh, in pure classical GR. Now, of course, that would just be an interesting uh, formal mathematical uh, analogy if it weren't for the addition of quantum field theory, which we need to, to have, uh, to, to, so that, you know, uh, uh, black holes are not perfect absorbers, but are now objects which can radiate and uh, equilibrate like thermodynamical, you know, systems do. So you need that. It's not GR in itself. It's GR and, uh, you know, so, some, some more, of course, well-established physics that you need for the coherence. Now, as I said, all of this is really remarkable, the level of coherence you get. It's, 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 it's super fascinating. It's very, very, very strong theoretical evidence uh, to believe that, thermo that, uh, that black holes are like this and are thermodynamic objects. I would grant that, absolutely. That's not, that's not the point. But the theoretical arguments, because as you yourself rightly pointed out, it could be that the objects that we now observe and believe to be black holes and therefore well described by that modeling framework may in fact not be correctly described by that modeling framework. They may be objects which are in some interesting sense different from what we thought they were. And how could we ever find out whether or not that's the case? Well, we need to look at the world and we need somehow empirical confirmation of, 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 of that, of, of these ideas. And I think, uh, I mean, my point is 
We will not get uh, empirical confirmation of this idea by looking at uh, terrestrial physics. Yeah, but let me say this, if we will have uh, um, uncontroversial evidence, and we may have it in the next decades, that uh, the object in the sky have an horizon. Mm -hmm. So they are endowed with an, uh, an horizon. And uh, um, then uh, I would say that we have tested the general relativity in regimes uh, um, where we, I mean, we know basically that the description as a metric theory of gravitation is uh, correct. And we know quantum field theory is correct in the regime in which we would, would be supposed to apply it close to the horizon of astrophysical black hole. You don't have uh, quantum gravity regimes, right? So if mm -hmm. you have the evidence that there is a horizon, you have basically no evidence to not trust uh, we, uh, that quantum field theory is OK there. Then these two ingredients together, basically by just consistency, they need, you need to have OK radiation. Now, OK radiation may be too cold to be tested. That's correct. The only way we could test Hawking radiation is to produce a micro black hole or find a natural micro black hole, which is extremely difficult. Um, but, but still, uh, in a certain sense, at that point, you are just testing, uh, you are putting together two theories that we are, you have tested uh, in many as different aspects uh, in a regime where at that point you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have any reason yeah. to expect that it's wrong, except for the Transvankian problem. But then uh, you have already an independent, uh, derivation showing you that uh, it doesn't matter the microphysics of the analog system. And the transplantian problem, really Hawking radiation is robust as long as the temperature of Hawking radiation is very separated from the microphysics scale. So basically you have a comparison of scale. If you have that separation of scale, mm -hmm. the derivation is robust uh, and it doesn't rely on, on whatever is underlying the space time. So at that point, I would be, I would be, I would find very difficult so my doubt and why I, I, in a sense, suppose your argument that we haven't proved yet that those objects with Hawking radiate is that we don't understand yet those objects. Uh, we have to be fair that they really look and smell like a standard GR black hole because we have now seen the shadow. We have, but those are regime where we haven't probed the horizon. We have probed the light ring better. Um, so we have probed an external region with respect to the, to the horizon. But once we will have, uh, firmer evidence that these objects have an horizon and we are getting there because there are ways to distinguish object with a surface from object with an horizon, albeit very difficult, probably more difficult than what people think now mainstreamly. Then uh, I would say that uh, it's very difficult to escape the conclusion that the okay, radiation is a part of nature. Uh, I mean, of, uh, of astrophy. In, it just, uh, it's just a very faint uh, phenomenon that uh, you will have to look in the different uh, aspects to. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Yes, well. I agree with that. So I think that um, it's not necessary to have direct empirical handle on the robustness of a black hole against transplanting physics itself. It may be enough uh, to, to have a direct observational uh, uh, evidence for other uh, facts, and in particular, of course, the existence of the horizon, which is a uh, a necessary condition for deriving Hawking radiation, uh, that would be that would be strong empirical confirmation. I agree with that. Yes, uh, but that is looking at the black hole itself and learning more about it. And once you do that, yes. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm very happy to hear. I mean, you're closer to this than I am. I'm very happy to hear that we may be getting close to to getting to that. But yeah, I mean, my point is for this, you need to look at black holes, not at uh, Bose Einstein condensates in your lab. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. This was a very intense discussion now. Um, is there anyone with maybe a short question? Because we had not so many opportunities so far. Anyone? Okay, it seems not to be the case. Then, um, yeah, I thank you again. Uh,